guys it's demon doing a top five on eminem but this is going to be in two parts because i know i'm going to go on rants with each of these songs and it'll be pretty lengthy for one video so number 10 uh is marshall mathers because well, one every time i listen to the mmlp this is the big one that i stop on um just because he's talking about oh like i was broke as shit before and Nobody gave a crap. It's kind of like the G-Eazy thing. Like when I said in the G-Eazy video how like nobody gives a shit about you until you have money. And once you do, everybody's asking for a handout like they were there for you in the beginning when they really weren't. He was talking about how everything has everything had changed since the first album. Like the parents that used to be mad at violence are now letting their kids watch it. And like, you know what I mean? Just like the whole that whole album. Um, he was talking about how his life had changed and whatnot, but this song really gets me because of the ICP diss, um, because he said Slim Anus, damn right Slim Anus, I don't get fucked in mind like you little flammy faggots or you know, whatever he said, um, whatever the lyric was. Uh, ICP actually went to a radio station that Eminem had just been on, or was going to be on, excuse me, and they made a remix to Hi My Name Is and they called it Slim Anus. So, and ICP's a really underground band, like they don't have anything on the radio, like they make really horror core stuff. So, I guess they showed that to Eminem, Eminem dissed him and they kind of went back and forth for a long time. But that's, like I didn't know that part of the, I didn't know where that origin of that part of the song came from. But since I learned about the diss, um, it, was a, it was a great, really good subliminal. And uh, he also had it in Ken Kniff as well, which added, that's why this song was number 10, was because of that diss. And just how he um, showed, how he painted the picture of like a before and after, like, oh, before I, nobody gave a shit about me. Now all of a sudden I have a stepbrother and a stepsister and 90 some cousins that all want me over for dinner. And now that I have a best selling album and I have money, I'm not seen as like a, like a poor white boy. And now I'm finally allowed to step foot in my girlfriend's house. Like, he's, he's like, okay, before you were treating me like trash, and now that I've accomplished something, your per your perception changes. So, that's why that's on number 10. Number 9, like, th these are all really hard to order as well. So, um, number 9 is Cleaning Out My Closet, because, come on, this is probably one of his most controversial songs, because he disses his mother. Like, who the hell does that? Like, I know on his new MMLP2 album, he kind of said, okay, I didn't, I shouldn't have done what I did on that song. I didn't mean it. I was just mad. I had anger and needed somebody to, you know, aim it towards and you fucked me up as a kid, you know, whatever. But even though he kind of discredited this song, it is still one of his most controversial songs ever made. Like he says, uh, remember when Ronnie died and you said you wished it was me? Well, guess what? I am dead. Dead to you as can be. So, and, uh. Haley's getting so big now, you should see her, she's beautiful, but you'll never see her, she won't even be at your funeral. Like, if this was aimed at a magazine, or like a double XL, or Vibe, or whatever, it'd be, you know, kind of up there. But considering that he's making these lyrics about his mother, makes it so much worse than if it was any magazine or publication, you know what I mean? So, this is a really controversial song, and when I was younger, I used to sing it, never really understood what the lyrics were about, and then as I got older, I'm like, this is really fucked up, he's talking about his mom. So, just the fact that he had, like, he had had a little subliminal distance towards her before in certain, like, catchy pop songs that he had made, like the, the more radio aired ones, which is kind of ironic, um, but this is really the one where he just, like, destroys her. Like, saying you won't see your grandchild, and saying that you're dead to your mother is just insane. So that's why it goes to number nine. Um, number eight is The Way I Am. This is really just talking about... Um, the reason this is on here is because he goes really into depth about how his fans treat him in public and how he doesn't have any privacy. Like, yeah, he's done like a fine line or whatever, you know, like different songs since then. But this one was... Like, and it's before a skit that says, if you don't change the album, it's not coming out. So this is really, like, a big, impactful place in that album, the Marshall Mathers LP, because it's, like, he's told, like, Dre does this, this, and this, and you're doing this, this, and this, and what you're doing doesn't work because what Dre did worked because he had this in his album, and you don't have it, and he's like, all right, man, whatever. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. This is This is me. This is my music. This is what I do. And he's talking about, like, how he's thankful for the fans that he has, but he's so, like, like my, he says, I'm not going to be able to top what my name is, um, 
and how he wants to die or just get fired because he's like he's at a constant battle with the media and he just he is angry at the fame that he has because he's lost his privacy, his identity. He walks around and he is Eminem. He can't go anywhere. He can't go shopping. He can't feed his daughter without somebody coming up and asking him for something and he doesn't owe anybody anything. And he's pissed off because he's stuck in this bubble of fame and he cannot turn it off. I don't know. Like, I hope I never get that famous. Like, I'd be okay with, like, a logic or a g Easy type fame where it's, like, people know you, but logic, like, in a video. Logic went to Disney World, right? And he didn't get stopped every two seconds in the video. Like, oh my god, you're Logic. Like, people know him, but people don't know him as crazy as they do Eminem or like a Snoop Dogg or a Tupac yet. I would like that level of fame. This would be absolutely terrible. Not being able to go outside and like walk around, feed your daughter, go shopping, go to a carnival, you know, go to Adventureland. He can't do that shit. He has to have bodyguards around him at all times. Even in the 2020 interview, like, they were walking around the streets of Detroit, which given is probably not the safest place to be, but he had to have bodyguards around him and they had to move like every 10 minutes so Eminem wouldn't get like attacked by fans, like just flocks of them wouldn't come at him, which is crazy to think that's the way he lives every day. So yeah, just the battle with fame and how he doesn't have any privacy uh, the way I am, that's why it's ranked number eight. Number seven is Sing for the Moment because I related to this song because it played me, it, it, I saw myself in, in his words. He painted my picture. Like, not saying, like, I didn't have, like, an abusive father, abusive mother, none of that shit, but, like, being locked away in your music and how that influences you as a person, that really connected with me. Because, I mean, I've been a fan of hip-hop for a long time. I just recently got into, like, Tupac and Snoop Dogg and Biggie, like, really into them. I knew who they were. But it does, the music that you listen to really channels your thoughts and your perspective on the world, and it can really brainwash somebody if, you know, need be. Like, if it says go get a gun, there are kids out there that will go get a gun because the music said it. Is it the music's fault? No, it's the kid for perceiving it that way. But it talks about how even after he's gone, his lyrics will live on in his songs. And that's another really cool metaphor because even, like, no, you, you can't discredit Eminem and what he's done. But the fact that his lyrical content is so above par, above the level of most of the rappers out there. Um, and it holds up to the, the past greats like Biggie and Pac and even like Nods' albums and stuff like that. Like he has had so many albums that have been so consistent. He knows that when he's gone, he's going to be remembered. Which uh, that to me is crazy. But just the, the picture that he paints of a kid locked away, stuck inside of his music really touches me because that's how I am when I'm pissed off, when I'm mad. I put on some headphones, like even Machine Gun Kelly said he does that as well, like when you're pissed, you just put on a pair of headphones and you listen to exactly how you feel, and when I'm angry, that song, or when I want to be trapped away from the world and locked in my room, that is the song I listen to, so Sing for the Moment comes in at number 7, and then to finish off this part, um, Mockingbird, um, and I always go back and forth on, I was going back and forth on whether to put When I'm Gone or Mockingbird on here, and to me Mockingbird is just a little bit more impactful. Um, because a message to your daughter about, like, I mean, growing up the way that you did, having the struggles that you did, um, and just protecting her, telling her you're always going to be there, leaving that type of memoir behind is beautiful. It's like a time capsule. Like, she can always go back and listen to that. As long as she lives, she's going to know that even when his her dad passes away, that he still loved her. And he, he was willing to protect her and do anything and go to any length to make her happy, um, which is beautiful. After all the darkness in these songs, it's really nice. To, even like 97 Bonnie and Clyde and Kim, like those had Haley in them. Like she was referenced in those songs. And to have one that's just like, you know, it's kind of a lullaby. And that's really sweet after, you know, all the controversial stuff that he had done in his career at that point to just take a step back and be like, you know what? Even through the fame, even through the really messed up relationship that I had with your mother, even through all the, the break-ins, the fights, the controversy, you're still my daughter and I'm still going to love you and I'm still just your dad. I'm not, I'm not Eminem to you, I'm just your dad. So, breaking that down and being able to take a step back and really 
tell her exactly what he was thinking, that he will always love her, whether her mom's in the picture or not, or if she is, or whatever their relationship is, he's going to love her. That's really important. Because once you're, like, I mean, my parents are divorced. I know that they both love me and whatnot. But to have a memoir like that after they're gone, it will be beautiful for her. And she can share that with her kids, too. Like, yeah, your grandpa might have been, you know, a lyrical mastermind, might have had some dark thoughts, but he loved me. And in turn, loving me, his love burns in me and I'm giving you the same love that he gave me. So it's like passing on the torch, but proving that no matter what label media or people give you, you can still be there for your kids. You can still love them and you are not as dark or as demonic or like the devil as he's perceived in articles and stuff like that, like newspapers, how he's perceived through the media eye. He's still a father and he still loves his daughter and he proves in this song that no matter what is said about him, he will be a stand-up father, and that is beautiful. So, number six is Mockingbird. Stay tuned for part two. Remember, you're as real as it gets. See you guys next video.